Well done. Uh, I'd like to begin saying, obviously, this past year has been a great year in the financing world, rates, et cetera, we all know. Defaults low, debt and equity capital readily available, insurance companies, banks, CMBS lenders were aggressively pursuing deals and looking at new and or refinancing opportunities. All said, good year. For 2016, there's some concerns. China's contraction, our own rate lift, select asset bubbles, and geopolitical uncertainty. As with most cycles, the confluence of negative factors can be dangerous. More optimistically, though, periodic corrections may take some of the air out of the tires and effectively extend periods of growth. Notwithstanding international issues and a recent bump in the stock market, we're getting a jump on the new year. There's plenty of volume in both new and what I call traded assets that are ready for financing. There are a large number of CMBS loans that were executed 10 years ago that are due for maturity in 2016. This is a huge opportunity for life companies who are far more competitive than they were 10 years ago and are now capable of taking on the CMBS market. Not only are refinancings being done by the investment sales side of business, we're seeing the value of leverage. Thus, in some cases, institutional buyers are buying all cash, while others are seeing the value of leverage in creating additional uh, incremental value of, of their deals. We're seeing a frothy and optimistic market for 16. Looking forward, a couple of thoughts. Rates. I continue to be optimistic that we're living in an incredibly low rate interest rate market. Sitting in the audience today, there, as Ron suggested, probably 1,500 different opinions on rates, and I am probably going to be different also. We'll see some minor bumping at the Fed, as we saw three weeks ago, with short rates. But we really should be watching spreads. And with our economy not as robust as it could be, and as a consequence of considerable individual debt burden in our country, be it home mortgages, credit cards, car loans, I believe long-term rates will stay low, and perhaps lower in 16. There's a correlation between consumer debt and GDP. The competitive market with tremendous appetite for good opportunities and insurance company lenders will cause spreads to tighten. Banks, always looking to increase their earnings, will be aggressive, and real estate is the place to do it. And finally, CMBS lenders are back with the same force we saw 10 years ago, albeit with widening spreads. New risk retention rules are expected, though, to increase CMBS spreads later in the year to perhaps 15 to 40 basis points. That we'll be watching. As I, ref I reference risk retention rules, banks are going to have to be very sensitive to the oversight of the Fed and other regulatory authorities watching the quality of their assets in the concentration of assets. We're still living with Dodd-Frank. Basel II is somewhat behind us. But there are going to be more suggestions, I use the word suggestions, for higher capital buffers and higher liquidity being imposed on banks in the future. Banks are going to be taking a hard look at deals that don't satisfy government authorities, lest it affect their own capital ratios. We'll be seeing some price definition, especially with LIFECOs where in the fully 75% leverage will get one price, and 60 to 65% will enjoy more aggressive rates. Although 75% is not expensive, certainly cheaper than equity, your real best execution is going to be 60 to 65%. As an example of floor loans, we're presently doing an apartment deal with preferred equity and effective overall debt levels getting to 85%, again, cheaper than equity. Real estate is an asset class. If you want to be in stocks, think last week. If you want to be in bonds, I think again. The quality bonds are difficult to find, and the risk of downgrades may lead to further sell-offs and greater allocation of real estate. Life companies are recognizing the same, and those that have 8 to 10 percent exposure in their overall asset portfolio are now looking to push back to the 15 percent level which they had some 10 years ago. There's an aggressive appetite for both real estate, both in debt and in equity. Office is hot. You've heard from my partners. The only real issue, and it was brought up, is the timing in building into a speculative forward market. The lead time can be long with zoning and procedural issues in downtown, as well as Jimmy pointed out, in the suburbs. Thus suggesting as to why existing product has such aggressive cap rates for, where you, so you're, as you're buying certainty with a stable product. You've already heard my partners again offer that same confidence in the area. Condominiums, like office, are difficult to predict as you're building into a market 
not knowing what will be there when the product is ready. Right now, we're all rightfully optimistic. Our neighbors here on the waterfront are enjoying incredible success. Back Bay, Beacon Hill, the same. The watchword here that I, I point out, though, is parking. Buildings that have it will be favored. I equate it to those, to those of you that might enjoy a Cape or a New Hampshire lake house. A true asset is that dock. Parking is the same in condominiums and in rentals. Parking is an asset itself, an incredible demand. We're seeing apartment buildings and condominiums being built in Boston without parking, and thus the demand of existing lots would truly make, it a, make that a trophy asset. Standalone parking garages have been an incredible asset, an asset class unto itself. Retail. In spite of the internet, the threat of drones, good retail backed up with sales numbers, with or without lease terms, is an asset that lenders like and will be jockeying for. Smart lenders are seeing through lease terms, acknowledging that good sales will consistently trump lease terms, as there's always another tenant waiting around the corner to capture those same sales if the tenants were to leave. In many cases, it's the asset's advantage for the tenant to leave those sales behind. The new tenant will undoubtedly be paying a more generous rent with a new sense of energy and capital improvements. They hopefully will be capturing the same sales in addition to adding new. All in all, short leases and retail without sales should not be a threat. Industrial, I've spoken of it in past years, not an Eastern Mass product, but we've seen it certainly in some of our recent nine-figure portfolio deals nationally. It's a great product. Apartments, I love them. To me, they're a defensive product. Everyone needs a roof, deserves and not only wants a roof over their head. The issue here is the cash on cash returns and penciling out the deals. Luxury product trickling down to subsidized products are all in demand. We'd have no reluctance in financing or finding the equity for apartment deals. Hotels. Boston, incredibly hot city with medical, educational, and financial baseline. We're financing several hotels at this time, both the debt and the equity. Good sponsors, good market, and great product. I'm only concerned with watching the exit side as we begin to see some incredibly pricey sales numbers attached to hotels. You really have to, though, digest and get into the numbers. Are they union or non-union hotels? Are buyers buying cash flow, or are they buying the leases in place on those hotels? I don't think we can be so arbitrary as to point out to this hotel at 350 a key, and this one at 945 a key, without truly understanding the whole program. Again, I spoke of debt earlier. Does it make sense to lock in longer rates today while you're still looking at sub 4% coupons? I'd argue yes. 60, 65% again is the right number for your LTVs. You can negotiate two to uh, two to ten year full term interest only, the so-called IO deals. We recently had a situation where the interest only, though, was quite creatively offered on the back end of the deal, which is unusual, but made sense, and the tenant improvement monies would be needed at, at later in the deal at lease expirations than necessarily giving the, the borrower slash the developer front end cash flow. Creative lender won the deal. Prepayment clauses are being negotiated with some flexibility with borrowers offering modest increases in spreads to, to capture a better back-end uh, exit. This time around, defeasance language is being more carefully crafted with enhancements in favor of borrowers. One of the year's highlights is a renewed interest in joint ventures. 2015 found us involved in a JV requiring a creative partner who worked with our client as a result of their ability to rezone the property. The client received a capital account as well as a cash out at the equity closing. This is not only reflective of strong appetite for quality deals, but of the willingness of creative equity partners to make deals work. Another highlight this year uh, has really been the addition of, of Scott and Doug Jacoby, who you'll hear from Doug in a second. New opportunities are working upstream and downstream with our institutional sales department, and it's been a great asset, and we, we're glad to have them here. As I move to wrap up, uh, I take a page out of Dan Shaughnessy, the Globe sports writer, making reference to cleaning out the wastebasket. So here goes my attempt. Equity is creative and available. The equity players that can morph opportunity into, uh, into core and begin pushing their maturities from the traditional three to seven year exits out to 10 years are gonna capture deals. Boston's a hot city. 
The failed Olympic bid and the consequent loss to Boston is not a red herring. In fact, in spite of all the ink spilled and the angst that surrounded it, I think it did several positive things for our area. One, it highlighted the structural needs of our community, be it transportation, housing, and parking. Two, it highlighted new opportunities for growth in Boston, namely the south side of the city, Dorchester and Widdett Circle. And from a benchmarking point of view, Boston has always been compared to, Bo to New York, Washington, and San Francisco. Now as we see foreign money flowing into Boston, I see us being compared to Paris, London, Beijing, et cetera. This is all good news for the, what, what we believe to ourselves to be a truly international city. So I thank John Fish, Steve Pagliuca, Tom Alpern, and so many others for the vision in driving that perhaps failed effort, but really a great effort, I think. I see Boston becoming a taller city. Mayor Menino, I think Ron pointed out in one of the slides, pushed the city out, both to the west, off the pike, and to the south, to Dudley Station. I see Mayor Walter's administration looking to give more FAR and going higher. Something we see going on in New York right now with 72 to 90 story buildings. This is good news, as sites become more scarce in Boston. We're a couple of years behind New York, and I'm not sure how high we're going, but I think height is gonna be part of our future. As you can see on the screen behind me, through our office and our Collier's national platform, we're following our clients outside of New England, up and down the East Coast and across the country, and we look forward to having the opportunity to work with you. And lastly, uh, my long-term partner, Dave DeVajan, left me this year. He's a good friend, and I wish him well in his career. If you need to speak to him, you can find him, I believe, at Walker and Dunlop in Walla Walla, Washington. And if you can't find him, please call us back. Thank you. <laughs>